Welcome to this event. Um, that song that you've just heard, it's called It's the Debt That You Owe, We Won't Pay. And it's by an artist called Arawa. And uh, Arawa is an artist and activist who uses music to create community and change. It's a song that recognizes the context for debt. Um, and it's based on a long history of colonialism and slavery. And that the responsibility for climate breakdown is in the global north. So we're just sharing uh, Arawa's uh, social media and website details in the chat box if you want to find out more about their work and their music. And yeah, so I just want to say a really warm welcome to everyone. Thank you so much for joining us tonight at our rally, uh, Resisting the Global Debt Crisis. It's amazing to see so many of you um, in this uh, Zoom call this evening. Um, and if you feel comfortable, um, I, I can see that some people have done it already, but please feel free to introduce yourself in the chat box, um, You know, add your name, say where you're from, because we'd love to get an idea of where people are joining from this evening. Uh, my name is Heidi Chow and I'm the Executive Director at Debt Justice and for those of you who are not familiar with our work, uh, we're a campaigning organisation based here in the UK and we exist to end unjust debt and its root causes. 
We work closely with people and organizations that are campaigning against unjust debt in their own country, in their own countries. And tonight's rally is all about platforming their activism and resistance and how we in the UK can stand in solidarity with all of these efforts. Now, this is a joint event tonight that we're hosting together with our friends at Debt for Climate, um, who we absolutely love working with. And so I'm just going to introduce you to Lorraine, um, who will be co-hosting this event with me this evening. And Lorraine will just introduce a little bit about the work of Debt for Climate. Hi, yes, thanks, Heidi. Um, I'm Lorraine, and again, welcome to this webinar. I am a global facilitator at Debt for Climate, and we are a global grassroots movement of movements, uniting social, labour, Indigenous and climate justice groups across the world. Our mission is single focused, but incredibly urgent. Our mission, sorry, um, to, it's incredibly urgent to cancel the illegitimate debts burdening global South countries so they can focus on a self-determined just transition and build climate resilience. We believe that true climate justice cannot happen without debt justice. And that means challenging this exploitative debt system. Thank you, back to you, Heidi. Thank you, Lorraine. Yeah, so I'm just going to start kick off this evening by just saying a few words of introduction about this event. Because right now we're in, a, we're in the worst global debt crisis for about 30 years, and it's having a really profound impact on people's lives. There are about 54 countries in a debt crisis right now, and in Africa, 34 countries are currently spending more on debt repayments than on health and education. Now, since the start of the pandemic, our research has shown that debt repayments for the 50 most climate vulnerable countries have doubled. In fact, lower income countries are spending five times more on debt repayments than fighting the climate crisis. And today's debt crisis has been many years in the making. Its roots can be traced right back to colonialism, where Western countries like the UK shaped the economies of the countries that they colonized in order to provide them with raw materials. Now, during independence, many former country colonies inherited weak economies, um, and then they had to survive in a global economy where the rules on things like trade, finance and tax were set up in the interests of rich countries. And if you add to this years of irresponsible lending by unscrupulous banks, then all it takes is an external shock to plunge countries into a debt crisis. And we've had plenty of shocks in the last few years, from the pandemic to global wars to food and fuel price shocks and the climate crisis as well. But the international processes that are supposed to help lower income countries in debt crisis are simply not working. Activists are taking to the streets and demanding an end to unjust debts. In recent years and months, we've seen protests around the world in response to the devastating impacts of the debt crisis. And this week, debt campaigners are joining forces in a show of resistance against the highly damaging lending policies of the two big development banks, the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank in the 80th year of these institutions. Now this reason, this resistance gives us reason to be hopeful. And that's why we're here. Around the world, people are fighting back. And in the UK, we have a really big opportunity to turn the tide on unjust debt because nine out of 10 debt contracts between financial firms and the lowest income countries are overseen by UK law. And a change of the law here in the UK could actually have a really big impact for countries in a debt crisis. We'll talk a little bit more on this later. But in the meantime, I'm really excited about our lineup tonight. We are joined by some really inspiring debt campaigners and activists who are at the forefront of fighting for debt justice. Um, they'll be talking about their own experiences of living in countries that are in crisis and how they're resisting. And as well as hearing from uh, an amazing lineup of speakers, we'll also be bringing you some spoken word and poetry contributions. Art often plays a major role in activism, and we really hope that you'll enjoy these performances tonight as well. Now, we've asked each of our speakers to keep their speeches to five minutes. We've got a lot to fit in tonight, and we want to make sure that we hear from all of them. So we may have to remind our speakers of this if they're going over time. And um, But we'll also have some time at the end of the call to put your questions to our speakers. So if you think of questions for them during this call, then feel free to pop them in the Q&A box. Um, and then we'll get, uh, hopefully we'll get some, these, we'll get these questions to our speakers um, at the end. Um, we'll also be recording the rally tonight um, and we'll send everyone on our mailing list a link to this recording uh, after the event. So first up, I am going to pass you to our very first speaker, Sharda Ganga. Sharda is a director of Projector Suriname. 
It's a human rights-based civil society organization focusing on the interlinkage between human rights, democracy, and governance, with a specific focus on women's rights and gender equality. Projecto is also the founder and coordinator of the Citizens Initiative for Participation and Good Governance, which is the largest civil society platform in Suriname. Sharda is also a playwright and a newspaper columnist. So I'm really excited to be handing over to you, Sharda. I'll give you the floor now. Thank you, Heidi and everybody. Good evening. And thanks for having me uh, all the way from Suriname, which is a tiny country right above Brazil, for those who never heard of us before. And we are usually not a topic on the world stage, but all this has changed in the past years. First, we became one of the most indebted countries, a victim of volatile international commodity markets as much as of national bad governance. Then, in the midst of that debt crisis, we struck offshore oil. In the four years since, we have lived in this dual reality. On the one hand, the present with an austerity program based on the usual measures dictated by one of the world's biggest development banks, the International Monetary Fund or the IMF, as we call it, and its usual have which reached its uh, its usual havoc on people's lives. While at the same time, we are living towards a bright future in which abundant all revenues will solve all of our problems and benefit us all, as our politicians promise. The one group that has already guaranteed, guaranteed its benefits from these future all revenues are our private creditors, the bondholders. They held out in debt restructuring negotiations with Suriname for an amazingly sweet deal in which they lay claim to our future oil revenues through a value recovery instrument. The debt restructuring thus resulted in even higher paybacks for them than the original loan agreement. And if all goes to their plan, up to 30% of the royalties from our first oil field will go directly to our creditors until the year 2050. We, like many other Latin American countries, will thus have to keep extracting our natural resources in order to pay off foreign debt. We will even have to keep borrowing when climate change hits us hard and thus keep extracting oil to pay those debts. And so the vicious circle continues. There is a word for that historical global system in which the global north benefits the most from the natural resources of the global south, isn't there? Our right to self-determination is violated in an even more profound way. In order to safeguard this windfall, the agreement with the bondholders is dependent upon Suriname making very specific changes to the, to the legislation of our sovereign wealth fund by December this year. If the legislation is not passed according to the agreement with bondholders, the interest rate on the value recovery instrument will increase. Foreign bodies again dictate how to use our resources. They even dictate our legislation. This is the new form of colonialism, using debt to gain access to our resources. How do you fight this, we wondered. The austerity measures have had a deep impact on the lives of people in Suriname. They sent the country into political, economic, and social chaos with protests and uprisings in 2020 and 2023, when people had had enough of the impacts of the debt crisis and stormed the parliament demanding change. Colonialism is a resilient beast, still echoing through in our present. Healthcare has collapsed, medicines are scarce, and operating rooms empty for a lack of materials and of qualified personnel as essential workers, such as teachers and healthcare workers, leave the country in droves, poached by institutions in the Netherlands or former colonizer who has an urgent need for teachers and care workers who speak Dutch. For years, we here thought that there was nothing we could do, that we had to fight locally against our government's bad habits, but that there was no way we could change the IMF, the World Bank, or fight the financial capital system in which irresponsible and corrupt governments can keep borrowing from greedy private lenders who only think of their bottom line. But then we met people like our hosts and our other speakers in virtual rooms across the globe. It was then that we realized that there is hope, that our problem is not just a problem of local bad government, governance and governments, but that we have had a his, that but, but that we have a inherited a historical problem. 
We should not take away the responsibility and accountability of irresponsible, selfish, short-sighted, and corrupt governments at home. But we should most certainly not stop there. As long as they can keep borrowing, they will. So together, let's stop irresponsible lending and borrowing. It is crucial for countries like Suriname that legislation in, for example, the UK that oversees the practices of private lenders is signed. And we are therefore so very grateful to have you all on our side. Thank you. Just trying to unmute myself there. Thanks, Sharda, for sharing. Um, this is a powerful and eye-opening um, and a stark reminder of why the fight for debt justice is so urgent and how crucial solidarity is in challenging this system. So next, we are going to hear from uh, many, Melanie Gunathilaka in Sri Lanka. Melanie is a climate and political activist, a human rights defender, a writer and an activist with debt climate. Over to you, Melanie. Yes. Uh, thank you so much for having me today. And um, just to give um, a brief uh, idea of how Sri Lanka got here today. Sri Lanka is a um, country that was formerly colonized by three colonizers. And when the colonizers left us, they did leave us with their own systems and their own model of development. And with that, we were uh, forced into this perpetuating cycle of debt that made us indebted to um, indebted to not only uh, uh, develop, uh, developed countries in the West, but also to uh, organizations, multilateral organizations like IMF and the World Bank and uh, Asian Development Bank. And fast forward to 2022, we had uh, an uprising of the people. There were uh, millions of people uh, who were protesting against uh, who, who were protesting against the then government. Uh, the key demand was asking for the president to step down, but there were also other demands, like one of the major demand was asking to uh, uh, one of the major demand was asking to give our stolen money back. And people also asked for right to life. And all of that happened as a, a result of continuous struggles of the farmers, of the teachers, and uh, student activists, uh, environmentalists, all of them continued to protest against the uh, government's, uh, uh, government's uh, actions that were being taken. So uh, just to circle back a little bit, in 2007, that's when Sri Lanka first went to international sovereign bond market. And that was, uh, uh, that was a decision uh, that was promoted in Sri Lanka, like especially for the decision makers, as something that would support the country. But actually what happened was um, we got into this cycle of debt where uh, Sri Lanka ended up taking uh, loans at very high interest rates. And also, um, uh, so what led to Sri Lanka's uh, foreign currency reserves to deplete in 2022 was actually uh, uh, servicing an ISP uh, and also servicing some of the domestic debt in 2021. So leading, uh, which we, like all of these uh, incidents that led to uh, the bankruptcy of Sri Lanka, then ended up uh, the country losing its food security. Uh, uh, the government took very harsh decisions in, in also uh, sh showcasing these uh, decisions as something environmental friendly or green transitions, but there was no consultation with the farmers or the people who were uh, or the people who were uh, victims of this. So in um, uh, so there were a lot of uh, urban population uh, who joined the protests as well. And by July 2022, we managed to uh, chase away the existing president. But then uh, the parliament uh, managed to install um, uh, a president who was part of the previous parliament and who decided to go ahead with the IMF uh, agreement. And with the IMF agreement, the Sri Lankan people, um, we experienced lack of transparency massively. Uh, 
very few population, very few people of population speaks English, but there was never any communication from the IMF to the people using uh, local languages. So people were clueless. It was just presented as the only solution that we uh, had in order to get away from the crisis that we were in. And uh, out of many uh, issues that we had to face with the IMF austerity scheme, I'd like to highlight one of them. That was the um, uh, that was the uh, cuts from the EPF or slashing the EPF benefits or the uh, social security funds, because uh, as part of the discussions IMF uh, bailout package, it included provisions for restructuring both domestic and foreign debt, emphasizing the need for a holistic approach. Uh, so what the government did was in that, um, without going to uh, without slashing any. Um, debt taken from the private creditors uh, for domestic debt, they went and slashed benefits that people were supposed to receive from the social security, that is the EPF funds. And uh, we had a president who was harsh, who repressed dissent, who, were, um, who was bringing in laws to curtail fundamental freedoms of the people, freedom of association, freedom of speech, these were done through legislations that were undemocratic and didn't um, abide by the uh, constitution of the country. But just uh, last month, two years after the uh, uprising, the Aragalaya, uh, we finally got the chance to vote for a new government. And now we have a new government in place, but they uh, inherit a country which has uh, high inflation rates, so uh, by end of 2020, the inflation rate of country Sri Lanka was 12%, but uh, uh, inflation uh, by mid-2020 was uh, close to 70%. And uh, food insecurity of, uh, uh, of Sri Lanka still uh, suggests that about 4 million people are still food insecure. And this also goes to show that um, uh, Sri Lanka, like the demands of the people who are asking for a GDP to be allocated for education. Sri Lanka allocates one of the lowest GDP for education in South Asia as well. And um, with all of this, we have now reached to a point where we have a new government or at least a new president and a prime minister, but we are still to uh, vote in a new parliament. And uh, just before, just two days before the uh, presidential election, uh, the previous president, uh, Ranil Vikramasinghe, uh, ended up uh, agreeing to restructure international sovereign bond uh, restructuring. Uh, they agreed to restructure their main principle. Uh, but the problem is the haircut Sri Lanka is getting in this debt agreement uh, is uh, not at all sufficient. And also, there's this uh, clause about changing laws because currently over fifty percent of uh, over fifty percent of our ISP is uh, ruled under uh, US law, but they are asking to change that because the uh, laws in the UK and the US are being changed. Uh, so uh, there's this this uh, stronghold or the chokehold of debt holders and the uh, countries. In, uh, and also the uh, wealthy countries who, who continue to pollute uh, the earth, where countries like Sri Lanka uh, is taking the brunt of this pollution as a country that is most uh, uh, vulnerable to climate change as well. So I think it's uh, one of our key demands. And um, not only as a, uh, a Sri Lankan activist here, but also as an activist with debt to climate, and uh, an activist with Yukti Sri Lanka, I am uh, demanding that our debt will be cancelled. So Sri Lankan people are given the chance to uh, make decisions that are good for us, decisions that will allow us to make uh, sustainable decisions, uh, make uh, people-centric green transitions that are just that are uh, decided by the people of Sri Lanka. Thank you. Thank you so much, Melanie, for sharing that um, the situation in Sri Lanka. I think the, the case of Sri Lanka really demonstrates how um, debt repayments have been elevated above, above the needs of people. Um, I really appreciate all the work that you're doing with Debt for Climate in Sri Lanka. And we 
um, yeah, we um, more, yeah, just want to send our solidarity to in Sri Lanka. And also, um, thank you for that update on the latest political situation in Sri Lanka, because I know you've recently had a change of government, as you've mentioned. Um, yeah, and also just thank you for staying up so late. Um, it's just like, you know, in Sri Lanka, it's about 10.30 in the evening. So thank you for staying up so late to join us, Melanie. Um, uh, yeah, so our next contribution is actually a performance piece um, by the Mukashi Trust School, which is a large community school in rural Zambia. Now, the students in this video, video are Helen Chabale, Lydia Mulandika, Elizabeth Mayanda, Tina Zulu, Maliwa Kuntempa. Um, and the background to this video is that um, the grade 10 students um, in the Makashi Trust School were set a project to work in groups to create a poem about how their lives had been affected by debt and colonialism. And then the students voted for the best one. And so this is the, the winning piece. Um, and just to let you know that this school has no electricity or internet. And so turning this poem into a video was very challenging, but we think this is an amazing piece, a uh, really brilliant one. So we want to share with you this evening. So we hope you enjoy it. Our theme is how good afternoon everyone our theme is how colonialism and debt has affected education in sub-saharan africa and our poem is entitled education, education colonized. colonized diverting resources away from education infrastructure restricted access to education but only for the local population their aim was to train not educate mother tongue not taught our mind so delicate learned arithmetics in a language we knew not mother tongue being forgotten every hour this has made sub-saharan africa reliant on african aid financing with resource exploitation and resource diversion they geared education towards labor force for resource extraction austerity measures led to overcrowded classrooms and reduction in teacher salaries this has caused a decline in the quality of African education and therefore colonialism and debt have affected African education and still have the negative impact of African education. From restricted access to education for the local population to creating a large division for educational system, focused on European history, culture and language, Eurocentric curriculum the African education it marginalizes. They undivested the educational infrastructure and resources for Africans. Later on, qualified teachers it lacked. They disrupted the traditional African knowledge transfer. Education structured in favor of colonial power with a debt rating budget constraints. Qualified teachers were difficult to hire. Means of improving our education was taken for debt settlement. The imposition of a the imposition of a European language as a medium created a language barrier for many in Africa. Hindering their access to education and perpetuating education inequalities, with debt being a significant obstacle to achieving education related sustainable development. Social hierarchies were enforced by colonialism with a dependence on external funding. This led to a lack of autonomy. Children despising their culture and speaking ill of their culture. And our names are Maliwa Kuntepa, Helen Chiwale, Elizabeth Mayanda, Liz Yamunzika. Tina Zulu. And together we say thank you. Oh, that's absolutely brilliant. And I bet you if we were in an in-person meeting right now, we'd all be clapping and whooping and cheering because I certainly am. Um, that's such an amazing uh, spoken word contribution. And we just want to say thank you so much to uh, Makashi Trust School, to Helen, Lydia, Elizabeth, Tina and Maliwa. You are absolute legends. Um, yeah, just a really quick reminder to um, add your questions to the Q&A box um, and we will get to them at the end. Um, so our next speaker um, uh, is somebody who may be familiar with to you if you receive our debt justice emails. Um, and that's Bernard Anaba. Bernard has been at the forefront at, of much of our campaigning for a new debt justice law in the UK over the past year. We've been really working really closely with Bernard, who we absolutely love. And uh, really love the work that he's doing with ISODEC um, in Ghana. Um, ISODEC stands for the Integrated Social Development Centre in Ghana. So I'm going to hand over, yeah, the the spotlight to to Bernard now to talk a little bit to us about the situation in Ghana. Thank you, Heidi, and good evening, everyone. Uh, it's a privilege to have the platform to share uh, Ghana's uh, um, about Ghana. So I work for ISODEC, and ISODEC uh, started um, as a service delivery, providing social services for communities. 
And uh, we realized that this is, after some time, realized this is not what we should be doing. We should be advocating for the government to do more for these communities by advocating for policy um, uh, changes and for more government uh, budget allocations to social services. Uh, the more we did our budget analysis to find out how much government to be to allocate to social services, the more we realized that the numbers did not add up, which means that the government was not receiving enough uh, revenues in order to distribute, to provide enough social services to the communities that we advocate for. Then we began to look at the issue of tax justice to see how we can whip up more contributions to the national budget for uh, to increase the, the, the national cake for distribution. And the more we did that, we still realized that that wasn't still adding up in terms of we never getting enough tax revenue uh, to be able to distribute for social services. Uh, we also realized that um, in terms of debt services, so much was going into debt services and particularly, uh, we also realized that after the mid 2000s, when Ghana was one of the countries that benefited from uh, debt relief, which meant that uh, majority of our debt was um, canceled and the, the country was uh, in a position to start on a good leaf. But very quickly, things did not uh, uh, come good. Uh, the country faced significant debt problems, which meant that uh, by the 2013, 2014, we have to go back to the IMF again. And since then, uh, the economic situation in terms of the debt has piled up and things hasn't really worked well. But by in 2000, 2022, 2022, uh, it even got worse, uh, which meant that the uh, Ghana has to default. And the more you analyze the situation, you realize that it is not only just about financial prudence, because most of the time when we advocate, we try to get the government to do the right things, to spend wisely and not to uh, waste uh, money in terms of expenditure. But the more we did, I realized that the issue is more structural and colonial. Uh, the economy is not in the position, no matter how hard we try to uh, produce enough uh, revenues for distribution. And in terms of the structure of the economy, uh, based on basically uh, raw commodities for export, it's not able to do that. So we began to look also deeply into the debt crisis and realize that this is an area that um, is really affecting uh, government's ability to deliver social services. So uh, in 2020, 2022, when the debt crisis actually hit, government was spending close to one third of its revenue to service debt, uh, which uh, brought untold hardship onto Ghanaians. And that really also uh, made a lot of, uh, brought about a lot of a series of protests in Ghana. Uh, citizens began to realize that look, things are not getting any better as much as they, they tried try to force the government to do the right things. Uh, there were a series of protests, particularly the government also tried to shore, shore up its revenue. Uh, that's in the later part of 2022 uh, to uh, introduce more taxes to be able to show up its revenue. That led to a series of protests. Uh, citizens really protested against the tax measure, which the government had to back down. But uh, it also did not mean that things got any better. Uh, you had a number of uh, protests in terms of labor unions protesting for improved uh, payment and improved uh, salaries. That also, you know, uh, affected so much. And the debt, when Ghana defaulted, what really happened is that inflation shot up to about uh, 50%, which means that cost of living escalated. Uh, fuel prices was beyond the, 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 the uh, purchasing power of the ordinary citizen. Uh, food prices were up. The city up to date has, uh, 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 the, 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 the city has deflated up to about 100% as now in terms of uh, by 2022. Uh, the city was about uh, nine cities to a dollar. Now it's close to 16 cities uh, to a dollar. So things has really got very bad. 
And the protests uh, also meant that in terms of the government restructuring agenda, uh, in terms of the debt uh, bill out that the government sought with the IMF, meant that some local bondholders and some uh, um, pension uh, funds were going to lose some money. And they all protested, a lot of protests on the street. It took several weeks of protest for the government to back down on some demands, but uh, that wasn't uh, e enough. Uh, it meant that the hardship also uh, uh, made a lot of people to resort to all sorts of ways to you know, survive. And recently, one of the protests that really governized, uh, that really you know, uh, took over the country was the protest against Galamse. Galamse is a phenomenon of illegal mining where uh, people go into the forest areas, particularly the forest and the pristine areas of the hinterland to mine for gold. And this phenomenon even became too much, too much for uh, for the vegetation in the sense that water, the, most of the streams and water bodies that uh, were, that Ghanaians depended on all got polluted to the extent that uh, water wasn't wholesome for Ghanaians any longer. So people actually protested for the government to, to sit up and to abolish, uh, uh, put uh, a moratorium on mining in general so that uh, the illegal mining will also stop alongside. That even led to the arrest of about 50 uh, protested uh, currently. Uh, some of them are even still in the custody of the government uh, for unholy be be behavior. So uh, the crisis is still ranging on. And what the government kept assuring Ghanaians in terms of uh, uh, reaching some uh, agreement with uh, bilateral and uh, uh, private creditors on uh, some debt relief, but uh, it's often just remain a, a agreement in principle, but we are not really seeing the real uh, outcome in terms of how it's relieving Ghanaians of the hardship. So um, it is a situation that uh, we continue to advocate. And as, as we speak, there are a lot of um, agitations to protest against hardship in the economy. Uh, if you walk on the streets of Ghana, you see the evidence of homelessness that has increased beyond what it used to be. So the debt crisis, as we said, uh, as much as we also protest and put pressure on the government, we also do realize that things are not getting any better because sometimes it is out of the hand of the government because of the nature of the situation being structural and being uh, colonial in the sense that uh, it also requires external um, government in terms of where uh, Ghana got its loans in terms of uh, where Ghana contracted its loans. So that government will also be able to put pressure on the creditors, especially the private creditors that often held up uh, the negotiations on uh, debt relief arrangements. And that has really dragged all this process for all this while. So we think that it will be good if we are able to get, uh, particularly for at the UK government, where most of Ghana's uh, creditors um, or Ghana borrowed most of its uh, loan, so that uh, it enforces uh, responsible learning, uh, putting in place a legislation to enforce responsible learning, and also to put in place uh, a debt resolution process which allows countries, uh, developing countries, to be able to quickly resolve the debt issues when the situation arises. Uh, so those are some of our demands that we would like uh, external government to also support uh, the people of Ghana to be able to overcome. Thank you, and thank you for your audience. Thank you, Bernard. Um, it's another incredible insight to just the serious debt crisis that is happening. And you can see a link that is shared in the chat so you can sign Bernard's letter to the government, which is calling for a new debt justice law um, here in the UK. Please um, share this with your friends and networks. Um, it's important that we, we get this law um, through. Let debt justice has been lobbying on this quite hard. 
So next, we are really pleased to be joined by CJ Simon, he is a spoken words artist who's going to perform a piece for us entitled Change and Chains. CJ Simon is a Black British writer and academic, playwright, spoken word artist, essayist, videographer and podcaster who uses multidisciplinary approaches to create politically engaging and challenging work. His writing has been performed across the UK, including at Southwark Playhouse and Birmingham, Birmingham Hippodrome, and he founded the company Fire and Folly Theatre. The spoken word poetry you're about to hear explores the complicated history of the colonised world, debt and the British Empire by framing the history in the language of everyday relationships. The floor is yours, CJ. Thank you. You wanted, a, uh, you wanted to be king of a house, but it felt too small. Burdened by the emptiness of your white walls alone couldn't keep securities falling. So you do what all men do, what men do daily. Beef up your prestige and get you a lady. That's when you sought her out, caught her in your leased out car, barter with my grandfather and sold him the stars, tied the noose around her finger and coveted your claim. If not by canon, then you count on laws and concepts foreign to her name to keep this West Coast queen in your Westphalian game, <laughs> thinking Mumsy might love being your plaything. She didn't. She was there, tired, tied to the hob. You stood hoping she'd liven your stock, warm your icy empire with the heat from her pot, while she feeds her kids with the collard greens from her plot. And you're shocked she don't smile, as your beast of burden, sweating your sugar, your cotton, your bourbon, unthanked and unpaid, your smiling servant, barely a person, and still, you ain't pleased by her service. Cause the walls are still empty, Threats still surface. Heard of moguls in the east coming to steal your purse, so you dig your heels in. You make her, her bore you a sun that never sets. Her skin now burned under the friction of your empty sex. As your kingdom begins to melt under the weight of your debt, she tried to tell me, your child, this ain't as good as it gets. But there was more to life than empty shelves, precarity and death. She tried to give me hope, but her strength wavered. Forced daisies from her, took all that she gave you, as much for the paper, stripped her completely to sell her flavour. Left her, her naked and barren, unable to wake up. This is what you did to my mother, my maker. Couldn't give her the divorce. That'd be too easy. She filled your walls, so you built more. Of course, she wanted to leave because your hunger grew so large, nothing could appease it. So you find new ways to suck blood from my mother's teat, beat her black, applied the plaster and worked her to the sleeve, cut her skin, wore her thin, then gave her berries to eat. She'd throw them up, but just enough, she, she could just about stand on her feet. She had so much life to give, and you don't even grieve. Not for her or for my brothers and sisters buried overseas in the famine and the bloodshed laid at your feet, because while you built your kingdom from selling their seed, your banks give cash when we all just need to breathe. You command them to run. <laughs> now they've broken their knees. And now it's just me and you. And I've read pamphlets and diaries. I, I know how you be. You'll point to the blackness of the sky and promise stars I can't see. You'll, you'll dislocate my knee and offer up your car. You'll point to your charity. I'll point to my scars. I've learned from these bars, these brokers, this silence. You don't need swords or walls. You make the wallet violent. I tried to free my mother, but you call me a tyrant, blocking out the noise of your IMF sirens who, who took the laws of guns and ships and made it about compliance and moving ships and passing bills, using their checks to control who won't and who will. And, and you know what? I can be violent too. 
I learned all that motherfucking shit from you. So if you don't want violence across this nation, then why not just grant me my emancipation? Thank you. Well, CJ, I've got to say that was really powerful stuff. Um, I, I feel sort of, sorry, I feel quite emotional, emotional hearing that. Um, yeah, so thank you so much for that really um, powerful spoken word. Thank you for the poignancy with which you've depicted empire, colonialism and debt, but through a relational lens. Um, yeah, thank you so much. That's absolutely brilliant. Um, and like I said earlier, I think, yeah, if we, if you could see people right now in person, they would all be clapping and probably like me, quite moved in, emotionally. So thank you for that. Ah, let me take a breath. <laughs> right. Um, our next speaker is somebody that uh, you might be familiar with, especially if you've um, been following our debt justice campaigns for a bit. Um, uh, our next speaker is Precious Columbuana, who is a Zambian activist um, who's involved in Fridays for Future, Debt for Climate in Zambia, and for several years now has been partnering with us uh, at Debt Justice as well. So you may recognize her, you may recognize some of her story um, because she's been part of our Council of Debt campaign and been helping us to lobby for a new debt justice law in the UK. Um, which, you know, and if, that law, that, if they, we ever won that campaign and we get that law, then actually it would make a massive difference to the debt negotiations in countries like Zambia and Ghana. Um, so yeah, we're really pleased to have Precious on the call and I'm gonna pass over to Precious now and she can update us on the situation in Zambia and some of the campaigning work that she's been doing there. Uh, hello everyone, uh, this is Precious. I'm going to start with uh, my story as a, a debt campaigner. And uh, I think this time around on how I, sh I should uh, start my story. I think I'm asking for just a five second, a moment of silence for the people who died because of um, they don't have access to medicine for those people who are dying because of hunger, for those people who are impacted by the climate shocks. Just a moment of silence, just for five seconds. Uh, thank you. I think the five seconds is up. I'm going to start my story on how my family is being affected by debt crisis. My father in 2022 was impacted by the, the, the floods. He doesn't have a home right now because of the floods uh, that uh, impacted uh, Zambia. Also, how people are uh, suffering. They don't have access to medicine. They don't have uh, access to good education. Girls and women are the mostly affected. Girls are being married off because they don't have food on, the, on their table. They are being married off to, to gain uh, maybe something like cows in, in exchange for them to have food on their table. And uh, we are in a uh, climate crisis. In 2024, the president of Zambia declared a climate emergency because of the droughts that we are facing. Zambia is one of the countries that depends on agriculture, mostly of um, the southern part of uh, Africa is also being affected by uh, the droughts. Actually, the, right now in Zambia, we are being affected by the dates, we are calling out, uh, we are demanding for date cancellation for Zambia. And also we are calling out for Black Clock to cancel the date that is being owned by Zambia. And also uh, this time around, we, are, we had some actions in April during IMF and the World Bank uh, annual meetings where we delivered a letter to the World Bank uh, after just delivering a letter to the World Bank, some of the activists, four activists were arrested uh, about three to four hours. It, uh, it, it was traumatizing for us 
as Zambians, it was very unfair for us activists to demand for, for our rights. And we were being arrested for our rights. And they told us, how can you call for these demands? These are the people who are driving the economy of Zambia. You need to stop for, you need to stop these campaigns because you can't target these people. These people, they are big people. From that time, we were arrested. We sat down and said, we will not stop because Zambians are being affected. Zambians are suffering. Zambians are dying because of uh, date issues. Zambians, they, are, they don't have access to medicine. Zambians, they don't have good quality education. And we need to fight this battle together as Zambian activists. And um, the last thing that I would say is if Zambia's date is being canceled, we will be, a we will be able to, uh, to have good education. We'll be able to have medicine in hospitals. We will no longer uh, suffer because of the date crisis. We also need uh, uh, everyone to be on our side because uh, debt issues has trapped Zambia into suffering. And also uh, going back to the story of um, our, our country and uh, our village and the most towns, people are going hungry. Last year, at least people were eating once per day. This year, 2024, people, they are going hungry. People are dying because they don't have food on their table. It's uh, unfortunate to say that I have uh, the opportunity to say on this uh, platform because I was very happy when I was invited to, uh, to be one of the panelists. This is the opportunity to say how we are being affected. It is an opportunity for me and other activists that are fighting for date cancellation and date justice. And uh, I felt like, um, I felt like this time around, I need to speak out. I need to, my voice to be heard because last time when we had the, an action during an annual meeting of World Bank and, um, and uh, IMF, we were arrested. This time around, we're calling out the Global North countries to stand with us, to fight with us, to demand for date cancellation, to demand for date justice. Thank you so much. Thanks, Precious. Um, wow, um, just so insightful, like all of these speeches. Um, that's uh, quite incredible because I know, you know, we worked together on putting uh, for the action on April and I uh, knew of your arrests at the time. Um, so thank you for like all of the work that you do. Um, so I'm really excited to bring you our final speaker um, who's going to tell us about the situation in Kenya. Some of you may have seen in the news this year about the protests there, which created ripples throughout Africa. Um, Justin Kampaga. Uh, Kampaga is a Debt for Climate Youth Coordinator. He's based in Nairobi, Kenya, and I'm going to pass to him now to explain the situation in Kenya and why people took to the streets early this year. Over to you, Justin. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Lorraine, and everyone of you here. It's my pleasure to be here tonight. Actually, I'm only here to try and demystify uh, the current state of affairs in Kenya. As you've all seen, uh, for the past like three months, uh, Kenya has had push and pulls, you know, political instability since June up to this point. So I wanted to try and make us understand the exact thing happening in Kenya as far as uh, debt crisis uh, is concerned. So uh, in early June, or rather up to uh, mid-June, we had an uh, introduction of the finance bill 2024-2025, which is a draft and uh, an, an amendment of the previous finance bill. But now this new finance bill 2024-2025 came in with very, very uh, oppressive uh, policies. Policies that were, mm -hmm. you know, very oppressive to the common monarch, the common uh, citizen, because now there was uh, imposition of new taxes, 
you know, rising of the VAT for common uh, commodities which are used daily by uh, citizens. And so life would be very unbearable with that new uh, finance bill. But now this finance bill, the source of it and uh, the biggest advisor of uh, how it came up to be and how it was drafted was the World Bank and the IMF. Because now Kenya, since uh, the year 2010, has been borrowing both bilaterally and from uh, IMF and the World Bank. And so our debt has really accumulated to, 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 to a verge of, of around 11 trillion as per now. And so uh, the government, uh, with advice from the World Bank and the IMF, sought it fit to you know, introduce a, a, a new finance bill that uh, imposes so many taxes on the citizens. But now that did not go well with the citizens. Actually, we came out in large numbers to occupy the streets, uh, to occupy Nairobi uh, city, which is our capital city. People traveled from all over the uh, all over the country, from every part of the country, from the, the northern part, the southern part. People came to occupy uh, Nairobi city. And actually, on the 25th of June, we occupied the parliament chambers of the Nairobi city, demanding that uh, as debt for climate, we were demanding that. Uh, you know, the IMF and the World Bank uh, canceled those debts because those debts were the major reason as to why we had that very oppressive finance bill. So we went to the streets, we took to the streets, we occupied that parliament building, and uh, the pressure really increased. We went uh, to the streets for three weeks consecutively on every Tuesday and uh, Thursday, but it was really traumatizing because now there was, you know, police brutality, you know, we had even the, the U.S. interfere with those protests because uh, we even saw the U.S. Army coming to the streets to you know, beat up and uh, tear gas as protesters. But uh, we were really trying to you know, drive the narrative and drive the message that IMF and the World Bank should exit Kenya. And not only Kenya, but even uh, you know, other countries in the global south which are really suffering from debt crisis uh, just because of those debt which uh, ideally it is them who owe us. And so uh, we really put the pressure, but it was really traumatizing because even at some point, uh, you know, because we were personally with uh, my counterparts from Debt for Climate Movement of Kenya, we were a group. And at some point I even saw, you know, a, a colleague whom we were, we were protesting being shot dead. I remember on that day, even uh, a counterpart of ours who we work closely with, uh, she's a woman from a certain CPO. She had her child, a seven-year-old child, you know, shot seven times with rubber bullets at the back. And it was really traumatizing. We had a very uh, tough time. But uh, after the three weeks of you know, demonstrations and uh, inputting the pressure, uh, finally the government dropped that finance. So it was actually dropped and uh, they had to now adopt a new one, which was even you know, more accommodative to, to the common citizen. But uh, the fight was not over because uh, our main goal and aim is to kick out IMF and the World Bank out of Kenya and uh, the Global South and to have them cancel those debts. So we continued and uh, in August, we, we, we brought together our troops once again and uh, you know, had a workshop and a training to try and come up with innovative and creative ideas to advocate. Because now we realized uh, they had noticed that you know, taking to the streets every week, they would tear gas us and we would lose the numbers. So we we had to come up with uh, creative ideas. Uh, we came up with ideas like you know, coming up with culture song, coming up with uh, art 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 pieces, or you know, driving the message on uh, debt cancellation, and so. Uh, we decided now to 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 to, you know, to merge going to the streets with uh, online advocacy, and so we've really been trying to push this campaign online. I know it has really trended across the world, and uh, not only in Kenya, but we saw the same thing happening even in Nigeria, and we were so happy about it. We saw it happening in uh, Uganda the other day, and we were so happy about it because now it's a movement, and people are now getting informed that uh, we are not only rejecting the government, but uh, the government of the day, but we are rejecting the IMF and the World Bank because uh, you know, 
as far as the government has uh, their mistakes in that uh, debt crisis because of corruption and such kind of things, but the, the root cause is the IMF and the World Bank. And that is the message that we are trying to get. So we've really tried to you know, carry on the campaign since June, July, August, and now we're in October. Actually, apparently, as I speak today, uh, there's a Senate sitting uh, on impeachment of the, of the Deputy President of the Republic of Kenya. The National Assembly passed the motion, and now it's in the tail end, that is the Senate. Uh, the, we are almost impeaching that uh, Deputy President because he's very corrupt, you know, and he's taking part in coming up with those, uh, you know, oppressive uh, uh, policies which they are now inputting in uh, the finance field, which is making life so unbearable in mm -hmm. Kenya. So our fight continues, but uh, I really urge us who are here tonight, you know, you join us in our fight online because uh we, we've realized you know when we merged the physical uh the physical protests and the, the online sensitization it really works good because i can tell you for sure right now in kenya even someone who did not know about uh debt for i mean uh imf and the world Bank, they have an idea about it and so that's what we're trying to do so i'll call upon uh all of us who are here to try and uh, see how we can you know, come up with solidarity and push this message uh, of debt, you know, being debt free uh, online, in X, uh, in uh, Instagram, and all other social media platforms. Uh, for Debt for Climate Movement of Kenya, and generally, we are, our handles are Debt for Climate Kenya in uh, X, uh, Debt for Climate Global, uh, I think, yeah, Debt for Climate, that is the global chapter, and Debt for Climate Kenya uh, for the X chapter. So I ask you guys, uh, you, know, you join us in this movement because we began it all the way from June. We are still pushing on, we are still pushing on. After the deputy president, we are going for the president. And uh, finally, I believe finally, uh, it will be a very tough fight, but I believe finally we shall be able to do away with the IMF and the World Bank in Kenya. And uh, that will be the starting point of doing away with the, the IMF and the World Bank uh, in the global South country. So uh, those are my remarks for tonight. So I just ask you guys to join us uh, in social media to amplify the voices so that at the end of the day, we get to succeed in this country. Thank you very much uh, for your time and for your audience. Uh, and let's continue fighting. Thank you. Thanks, Justine. Uh, Justine, it's uh, just incredibly moving stories that we have heard tonight. We have been treated to um, an amazing range of speakers, spoken word um, and song. Uh, so tonight is all about marking these powerful acts of resistance and finding ways to stand in solidarity with the debt activists like our speakers tonight. We're going to ha have some time to put your questions to our speakers in just a few minutes. So if you haven't already done so, please pop your questions in the chat and we hope we have time to answer most of them. Um, in the meantime, just a quick reminder of how you can show support and solidarity for the activists that we have heard from tonight. You know, first, we are calling for a new jet debt justice law in the UK that would force private lenders to the table in debt negotiations and it would prevent them from getting more in these negotiations than other lenders. So we're sharing debt justice action, targeting the government in the chat now. Please sign it if you haven't already. And if you have already signed, you can take two minutes now to send it on to three of your contacts or share it on your social media. Secondly, we want you to join Debt for Climate and come and attend one of our onboarding sessions. We have chapters in over 30 countries. You will see the link in the chat to register, or you can just head to our website, debtforclimate.org. And thirdly, we have a digital day of action called 80 Years Are Enough, and that goes live on the 25th of October. The IMF and World Bank, who you have heard from a lot tonight, are meeting in Washington, D.C. between tw um, the 21st and the 26th of October for their 80th meeting. And there are protests happening globally. The link to our digital action will be posted in the chat so you can get involved on the 25th of October. No, if you click on this link, it will show an active campaign because that's when we want it to go live. So mark it in your diaries with the link and let's put further pressure on the IMF and World Bank to say 80 years are enough and we need to cancel the debt. 
So there are many questions to go through. So I'm going to pass over to Heidi to kick off the Q&A. Over to you. Thanks, Lorraine. Yeah, so on the questions, we're going to do a couple of round of questions. Um, each round will have about three, two or three questions. So I'll kick off with this first round. Um, so we have a question from David Kenvin, who says, how do we ensure that countries are not held responsible for the odious debts incurred by their governments? That is, debt incurred for the oppression of that people of a country or debt incurred for the enrichment of the ruling elite, not the benefit of a country. Um, and the second question is, what stops Suriname drive, driving a bargain more in its own favour? The third question in this round would be, uh, what would be the impact for people in Kenya if the debt was cancelled? So maybe the first question about odious debts, uh, maybe Melanie could take that question. Um, There's a question about uh, what, what stops Suriname from driving a bargain in its own favour. Maybe Sharda can answer mm -hmm. that. And then Justin, could you answer the question about the impact of people in Kenya um, if the debt was canceled? Uh, yeah, Lauren, should I go first or? Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, um, I actually uh, typed uh, half of it on the chat as well. So I'll try not to repeat the same things. Uh, so. The question of odious debt is one of the crucial uh, challenges that we are currently faced with, because in Sri Lanka, um, one, we had this uh, set of leaders who've been taking loans or who've been taking debt without accountability and without transparency. And we also have private sector who are, um, who are also contributors to this whole crisis by uh, sending foreign uh, reserve earnings out of the country. So in terms of understanding how the debt, uh, how, how this debt become odious debt, it would have to happen through an independent audit that has been done in the country. And um, for that to happen, we need a government with a political will. Uh, and all this time we had the same leaders who were responsible for creating this same crisis as our leaders. So we've just had a new opening uh, where we are still very hopeful that this government will have uh, the political will in order to do this, uh, this independent audit, this transparent audit in order to find out who's responsible, who's accountable. And also like we have several records that have gone missing from the entries in the Auditor General uh, Department. So, that that's like you know, we need honest leaders to conduct this audit. And on the second part of this is we need global infrastructure put in place to hold these corrupt politicians or the corrupt officials who took the debt accountable and also the creditors who provided um, a debt to Sri Lanka, knowing or not Sri Lanka, like you know, any country uh, knowing that they're not able to pay back knowing that they cannot bear these uh, in high interest rates with the struggles within the country. Uh, I'd also like to mention that Sri Lanka has gone to IMF 17 times now, right? And we only received independence in 1948. So within 70 years, we've got 70, a few, uh, 70 odd years, we've gone to IMF for 17 times. And that goes to show that this uh, structure of this, this financial architecture does not work. Right? And um, so to answer the question again, like we both, we need both local and international frameworks in place and the political will and honest leadership to achieve this. Yeah, thank you. That's, that's great. Thank you so much, Melanie. Um, can I uh, call on Shada to ask, answer the question about uh, Suriname? Uh, I'll just repeat the question for you. What stops Suriname um, from having a bargain more in its own favor? I actually wanted to start by saying, well, the same applies to Suriname. Much of uh, much of what Melanie was saying, it's it's. Uh, I think if you look closely at um, at countries like ours, you will see the same uh, scenario playing over and over again. But putting that aside, um, the question was what what kept us from uh driving a better bargain um it was a collection of 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 um of factors first of all we had already defaulted on on the loan so 
that put us in a in a in a quite a bad spot um because we had already defaulted without consulting anybody or anything when the new government came they just said oh we're not going to pay anything anymore um and that you know within a, within a, within a year uh they were again with their with their back against the wall then you had this um this circle of uh, uh lenders uh, creditors and the IMF uh this this game that was being played where um the 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 IMF said uh one of the things you need to do before you can enter into our program is that you need to deal with your creditors you need to to enter debt negotiations and the lenders said you need to strike a deal with IMF first we need to uh be ensured that the IMF is in country so that there's some form of oversight uh before we will strike a deal with you so you know which comes first the the chicken or the egg um the third factor that played a role and and that is totally based on uh, uh project our my organization's uh, understanding so uh, unofficially is that we have a lack of capacity and understanding of how to negotiate how to, how to deal with these uh global lenders with these global institutions and with these uh, um, private lenders um, it is it requires a level of technical understanding and negotiations that we simply don't have um, we paid for it uh, we hired um, some uh, uh, foreign companies to uh, to negotiate uh, for us we paid them a few million and this was this was the result. Um, so it's also a lack of understanding of the government that um, if you look beyond governments, and there's a there's a whole opportunity of technical assistance from, for example, civil society in other countries, um, and and um, activists that can help you in uh, in driving a better bargain, but um yeah so so it's a couple of factors thank you shada for that um and then just uh, for the uh, final question in this round is for justin uh, what would be the impact for people in kenya if debt was cancelled uh, thank you once again uh, uh, on the impact of uh, debt cancellation for Kenya, as I mentioned, uh, the main cause of why life is very difficult in Kenya is because of the debt crisis that we are in. Because uh, the greatest share of uh, GDP, the greatest share of uh, income you know, goes to servicing these loans. So number one, if these debts are cancelled, we are going to have our taxes. Taxes like uh, the pay, which is so high right now. Actually, some people are really complaining and even think that uh, you know, leaving uh, that tax to the government is even better than you know, getting your share from, from, from getting your share after taxation because it's really, really uh, oppressive. Taxes like the VAT, the value added tax, they are really high. They have gotten to 16% even for the basic commodities, making life so unbearable for you know even the common uh, the, the, the common citizens. Uh, number two, if these debts are cancelled, we are going to have money circulating in Kenya. Because as I mentioned, a lot of money is going uh, to servicing these loans. And uh, when we have uh, our money and retain it within Kenya, we are going to even have our country get to develop even faster. As you know, Kenya is still a developing country. We really have a lot of challenges when it comes to infrastructure, a lot of roads are undone. A lot of schools are not in very good conditions. You know, even uh, some hospitals are, you know, dilapidated and uh, poorly equipped. But uh, if this, these debts are cancelled, it means that uh, all our revenue will be retained and, uh, you know, 
maintained within Kenya, and that means uh, more supply of cash in the economy, and the government is even going to have an easier time to develop our country to the next level. Thirdly, uh, we need, uh, that is going to give us financial sovereignty as a country. Again, as I mentioned, uh, the, the, the biggest share of our revenue is going to servicing these loans. And now that means as a country, we don't have that uh, financial sovereignty because yes, we get uh, revenue from taxes, but the biggest share of these uh, taxes and this revenue end up you know, paying loans to China, to IMF, to the World Bank, you see, that denies us that financial uh, sovereignty as a country. And so if these debts are canceled today, uh, I, can, I can assure you, we are really going to have a tremendous change uh, in Kenya as a country. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Justin. Um, so moving on to uh, next three questions. Um, this one on wall is for Bernard. Um, it's from Justin in the chat. Um, I've heard that developing countries pay 10 times the interest rate of rich countries, even though the risks of loans are not that different. Is this true? And if so, why? Over to you, Bernard. Thank you. Thank you for that question. Um, yes, uh, generally, I don't know if it's exactly 10 times more, but it's certainly high. Uh, Ghana's debt in terms of interest rate ranges between 7 to 10.75%, uh, 7, uh, 10.75% uh, yeah, percent. So that is quite high. And that is a significant portion of the debt. And that really uh, puts a lot of burden on developing countries. I want to give a scenario. For instance, if you take, for example, uh, uh, Greece, even with all its problems in 2018, uh, at the same comparative level, borrowed at 1.8%, whilst Ghana borrowed at 8.63%. So at the same rate, uh, if Ghana borrowed uh, 2.5 uh, uh, billion dollars over 30 years. Ghana is paying about $7.3 billion overall period, while Greece will be paying uh, only $1.6 billion over the same period. So it tells you that if a, a developed country, the difference in terms of how much you'll be paying out as this thing. But if you look at the risk, uh, I don't think Ghana has uh, had uh, uh, different risks as compared to Greece at the time that it was defaulting on its debt. But the interest rate is still, you know, quite high for developing countries compared to uh, developed countries. So It feels like we might have lost Bernard there. It could be his connectivity, I'm guessing. Um, Lorraine, should we move on to the second, maybe the second question in your round? Yeah. Oh, you're muted, Lorraine, sorry. I actually thought that was myself because I have so many things open on my laptop. So I thought it was me, apologies. Um, so let's wait until Bernard comes back to finish that. So the next question we've got is um, for Precious. Um, do you think that resistance against the debt crisis is growing across the global South and lower income countries? Precious. Uh, firstly, uh, global South countries are the most affected by the debt crisis. Right now, the debt crisis in the global south they are growing because our government they are still borrowing even the previous government from uh, zambia they have already borrowed a lot of money so the debt crisis is still growing thank you thanks precious um just do spotlight okay um so our next question is um from chip from netherlands hello chip um, this is for Sharda. Do you see a specific role for activist groups in the Netherlands, such as Debt for Climate, to support the struggle for debt justice in Suriname? Thanks, Chip. 
Um, you... I uh, I think it's Yip. It's a yip. Uh, hi Yip. Uh, if, well, well, if he's Dutch, I, I uh, so Yip. Um, I I I started smiling when I read the question. Uh, where to start? Um, well, first of all, it's not a funny question. It's I'm I'm really thankful for the question, um, because at least you asked the question. Uh, because sometimes um, it it shows that you understand that there's a a a, a delicate balance when it comes to the relationship between former colonizer and uh, the the colonized in um uh, in trying to achieve something together um and in in building relationships and how we can move uh how we can move forward so at this moment um it's something i would have to uh um have to think about because um, if you follow the news uh, in Suriname and you're a bit familiar with the um, with the relationship of, uh, between our countries, especially given your new government as well, um, you you may have an understanding of the uh, of how careful we need to tread in Suriname um, when we engage. <clears throat> when we engage with Dutch uh, act, uh, activist groups, because um, if it's not to the uh, uh, if it's not to the liking of governments or to the liking of other politicians, um, the Surinamese activists or the Surinamese groups will be seen as uh, as a uh, 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 well me me who met a feyant. How do you call it? This, uh, in in English is that you're joining the the col the colonizers you're speaking the colonizers uh, language so so it's a it's a very delicate balance we have to uh, we have to address but um, I'm very very happy to discuss this with you um, in in a, in a chat and see how how we can be um, how we can work out something that is. Um, of value to us all. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Shada. Over to you, Heidi. Just wondering if Bernard's back on the on the webinar. Bernard, if, you, if you're back, maybe you can finish off the uh, answer to the question that you we kind of we kind of lost you halfway through your answer. Do you want to? Right, yeah. right. Thank you. So, I was, basically, I was, I was saying that yes, it, it it's true in the sense that the average uh, borrowing rate in Ghana and most developing countries around uh, between eight to nine percent, compared to uh, in developing countries which is between really zero and one percent. And I gave an example of uh, Greece, in where Greece was also having uh, debt challenges, but yet borrowed at one point eight percent, whilst Ghana was borrowing at. 8.6% when Ghana did not have any debt crisis. So uh, clearly the rate at which developing countries are borrowing is one of the biggest problems why our debt uh, problem continue to escalate. Thank you and over. Thank you so much for that, Bernard. And sorry that you had to you kind of lost connectivity a bit just then. Um, so I think we've come to the end of our um, time that we have for questions. And I just want to say really sorry if we didn't get around to your question this evening. Um, but we also want to respect your time. Um, we know it's evening, so we do want to finish on time at half seven. Um, so, yeah, I just want to say a really big thank you to all of you for coming this evening. I want to say thank you to our speakers and to the poets as well. Um, we've learned so much about what's happening on the ground uh, for people living in those countries with a debt crisis. Um, just want to say thank you so much to our speakers for really explaining the political context, um, but also really showing us how personal this is. And, um, you know, some people may say that debt is too technical uh, to understand, but actually it's really just about people's lives, human rights, dignity. It's about justice. So we really want to offer uh, each of our um, speakers this evening you know, our solidarity for your resistance, your protest, your campaigning and your activism. Um, things are dire. Our speakers have shown us what it's like living in a living with the legacy of colonialism, and living in a world dominated by neo-colonialism, neo-colonist rules. 
but we all know that we also know that change is possible and we have won debt cancellation before and we know that when we come together we can do it again um, next year is a particularly important year in the fight for debt justice uh, many faith groups, um, activist groups, campaigning organisations um, are gearing up for a really big campaign next year. It's been 25 years since the original Jubilee 2000 campaign, the, the Drop the Debt campaign, as uh, it was called sometimes as well, um, where this campaign managed to win large scale debt cancellation, uh, which saw about $130 billion worth of debt cancelled for lower income countries. Um, groups around the world are already planning how to make next year really count for debt justice. So we really encourage you, please, if you're interested in getting taking part in this big global campaign next year, please sign up um, to receive our emails and you'll get updates and information on the campaign. Um, and in the meantime, we really hope you've enjoyed the event tonight. Please sign up to Debt Justice Petition. The links are going up on the chat right now. Please follow Debt for Climate on all of their social media platforms. Um, the links are, are going in the chat box right now. So um, you can continue the conversation. You can continue to follow the campaign um, by signing up um, and following uh, Debt Justice and Debt for Climate. Um, and if you've received, if you've signed up to receive our mailings, then you will be, we'll also be sharing a recording of this event tonight um, in the next few weeks. So um, I just want to say thank you so much for coming and we look forward to seeing you at the next event. So goodbye from us at Debt Justice and from our friends at Debt for Climate. Bye. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye. 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 Bye.